Hi again, good afternoon. For our last discussion, I want to turn viruses on their end and make them truly beneficial. You may remember we started off way in the beginning talking about how probably most of the viruses infecting us are good. We're not sure how, but we can actually turn them for the good. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about viral gene therapy. What do I mean by this? I mean using a virus, which we give it the term virus vector, because we're putting things into them. We're going to use virus vectors for a number of purposes. First, to do actual gene therapy, which means we give patients a gene when they're either missing it or they have defective versions of it. So we can put the normal gene into a virus vector and deliver it to the patients. And that is what most people think of as gene therapy. But I also put these other categories under gene therapy as well to deliver an antigen, as in a viral vaccine. We've mentioned some of these already in this course, but they fall under viral gene therapy because we're using vectors to deliver a part of a virus. We can use viruses for doing what we call viral oncotherapy, that is to kill tumors. And we can take two approaches here, as you, you'll see. We can use unmodified viruses, or more likely and more frequently now, we can insert additional genes into the viral genome to make them more effective at killing tumors. And of course, vectors have huge uses in research outside of the practical applications that we're going to talk about today. So what I would like to do is go through a number of examples of each of these categories and show you how these are actually being used today. It all starts here. This was something we talked about, I think, in lecture two when we talked about methods, and that is making infectious DNA copies of viral genomes. And this was first done in the 70s, first with bacteriophages, then with animal viruses to convert the genome into a DNA copy for RNA viruses or to take the DNA of the virus that's already a DNA virus and put them in plasmid vectors so that they can be modified because the techniques of recombinant DNA, which arose in the 70s and 80s, can be used to modify genomes in terms of putting in therapeutic genes or removing genes that you don't want to be there. So this is the example I show with poliovirus, where we can take the viral RNA and make a DNA copy of it using reverse transcriptase. And this is the power of having that enzyme, reverse transcriptase, which can be used to make DNA copies of RNA genomes. So now we have a copy of poliovirus DNA in a plasmid, which can be grown in bacteria. And then we can take that DNA and introduce it into cells, and that will initiate an infectious cycle. That's enormously useful, of course, because it allows you to modify the viral genome. So for every viral vector that we talk about today, this technology, the infectious DNA clone, is used to get the final end product. Let's talk about a few of the different kinds of viruses that are used in viral gene therapy. We're going to touch on some of the key players that we've talked about in this course so far. The first one is adenovirus. You may remember adenovirus as the rather large double-stranded DNA containing virus. It's got an icosahedral capsid with the very unusual fibers coming out of each five-fold axis of symmetry. Inside the capsid is the linear double-stranded DNA genome. It's about 36,000 bases in length. And it is very densely populated with open reading frames, as you can see on the map below. This is a transcription map of the viral genome. In green are the viral mRNAs that are made 
by transcription from the viral double-stranded DNA. And the DNA is transcribed on both strands to maximize the efficiency. You can see the DNA binding protein and the DNA polymerase are encoded on the bottom strand, and many of the structural proteins are encoded on the top strand. When people started to use adenovirus as a vector, they had to pay attention to these open reading frames. It couldn't disrupt them. But as you will see, the latest generation adenovirus vectors, we actually call gutless vectors, not because they're afraid, but because we've taken almost everything out of them. So let me tell you how we got to those. It's very interesting. Why do we use adenovirus vectors? Well, one of the main reasons we would use any virus vector is for its ability to infect post-mitotic cells. That is, cells that are not dividing. Not every virus can do that. As you'll see later, adenoviruses can very efficiently infect post-mitotic cells. And you may draw upon your vast knowledge of virology to remember that adenovirus will make the cells divide when it infects them. So this limitation is not a problem. It's a pretty fast onset of gene expression, 48 hours or so. The virus remains separate from the host chromosome. We call that episomal. So there's minimal risk of insertional mutagenesis, as you'll see later. Some other vectors have had that problem. Since the genome is big, we can put almost up to the size of the genome of foreign DNA, 37 kilobases, into it. It's easy to make pure concentrated preps to grow them up and purify them. There, there are a number of human serotypes, and that's important because once you give a adenovirus to someone, they're going to make antibodies against it, and you can't use it again. So if you need to go back for multiple infusions, having multiple serotypes is good. There are also animal serotypes because many people are going to be immune to the human serotypes that we can use. And of course, the drawback, as with many viruses, is that they're very immunogenic. And if you need to give a 20-year-old gene therapy, it may be that they already have immunity to 10 different serotypes, and that's something you'd have to check. Let's go through the development of these vectors historically, just to show you how they progressed. The first generation vectors were deleted of two genes, the E1 and the E3 gene. So at the top, the genome is shown, the wild-type genome, double-stranded DNA, inverted terminal repeats at both ends, and the psi sequence, which is, of course, the packaging sequence. It's essential for you to keep that there. Otherwise, whatever you're putting in the vector will not get packaged into virus particles. So first-generation vectors deleted E1 and E3. You can see those areas shown on the bottom line. The E1 region encodes T antigens. We don't need these for delivering genes to an animal, a human, because the virus is not going to make new particles. In gene therapy, we deliver a gene to the cell and it's expressed. We don't worry about making infectious viruses. In fact, we don't want to make infectious viruses because that takes it beyond our control. So remember, E1 encodes T antigens, which antagonize RB and P53 to allow the cell to get into to dividing. So the DNA synthetic apparatus is available. Well, we don't need that. We don't want the DNA to replicate. We also delete E3 because this region encodes immunomodulatory proteins. We don't worry about antagonizing the host in any way. And so you can see that the early vectors were designed based on fundamental information that in part I've told you in this course and which maybe up until now you have thought is unnecessarily clogging your mind, but in fact, it's important to understand how these vectors work. So that was first generation, but as you can see, most of the genome still remains, so you don't have a lot of space to put foreign genes. Second generation vectors, we went a little further, in addition to deleting E1 and E3, were introduced deletions of E2, and E4. Again, as people did experiments in cell culture, they would remove these genes and found that the virus could still enter the cell, express its genetic information, 
And that would be enough to do gene therapy. You don't need the virus to replicate. So that's the second generation. And finally, the third generation is what I had referred to earlier, the gutless vector. All the genes are deleted. What you're left is only with the two inverted terminal repeats, the ITRs, and the psi sequence. Got to have the psi sequence to package the vector, and then you can put in between them whatever gene you want to put in for gene therapy. If you want to grow the vector up by itself in large quantities, you put some kind of stuffer DNA in it, and then you can purify that and cut out the stuffer and put your gene into it. This virus, of course, if you had an adenovirus with a genome like the one shown on top, this would be very disabled. So you have to have a helper virus produce the capsid proteins to encapsidate that genome. And on the bottom here is the, the way this genome is produced. So that's the entire adenovirus genome at the bottom. You have deleted the middle. And what's left is th this little vector shown right above it here, where we have the left inverted terminal repeat, the packaging sequences, all those little blue arrows, and the right inverted terminal repeat. And there's a promoter that remains there, shown by the red arrow. And then you can put your insert right there. But in order to get that genome packaged, you need a helper virus. And the helper virus is so cleverly produced so that it does not get incorporated into the vector. Because the, vec the, the helper virus is almost wild type. So here's how that was made. It's very interesting. And throughout these gene therapy applications, you see a lot of clever engineering. So at the top here is our vector, again, with our insert. Remember, the two ITRs, the packaging sequence, the insert. What you do is you transfect this into cells that are infected with a helper virus. The helper virus has the genome shown down here. It's the full genome, and it has, in the packaging sequences, two LOX-P sites. Those are shown by the red triangles. LOX-Ps are sites where cleavage occurs by the Cree recombinase, CRE. So these are substrates for the Cree recombinase. You then take this virus with these Cree recombinase sites in them. You infect the cells. These cells are producing E1. When this vector infects the cells, remember, they've already been transfected with your vector DNA, the Cree recombinase cuts out the packaging sequence. And the packaging sequence is removed, so the, the helper virus, which is providing capsid proteins and other factors that are needed for replication of this vector, is not packaged because the, the packaging sequence is removed. So it's a very nice way of using the cree lock system to get a vector produced. You have the capsid encoded by the helper, and in that capsid is just the vector DNA only, because it has the packaging sequence and your, your helper DNA does not. So again, this is based on a lot of fundamental work using v these viruses in cell culture. Adenoviruses can also be extensively modified in different ways to target them in specific fashions. And they're shown here. This is called vector modification. There are three different kinds shown here. For example, you can modify the vectors, which are, by which I mean the virus particles, with lipid microvesicles or polymers. And this can reduce the immunogenicity of the particles. So you're adding these polymers, essentially, to the virus particle in, in an attempt to shield it from the host immune system, and that works to a certain extent. You can also try retargeting the vectors. This is done frequently with adenovirus vectors. You can modify the capsid with peptides or natural ligands. If you have a receptor on a specific cell that you want to deliver the virus to, you know it's ligand, you can attach the ligand to the adenovirus particle polymers, so you can target the viruses to specific receptors. You can also engineer the fiber protein. You can make chimeric fibers. These adenoviruses bind different receptors, and that's in part determined by the fiber. So you can make recombinant fiber proteins, 
or you can add peptides to change the cells to which the vector will attach. So there's lots of activity in these kinds of areas going on, not just with adenovirus vectors, but with other ones as well. And again, you can understand all of this. You can understand how all of this works because you've learned it in the course uh, of this virology course. So that's adenovirus. We'll talk about some early experiments using adenovirus vectors in a moment. The other vector I want to tell you about is adeno-associated virus vector. I see the most activity right now ongoing with these vectors. I'm on the Institutional Biosafety Committee at Columbia, so I get to look at all the recombinant DNA protocols that are being used. And I'm telling you, over 10 years that I've been on this committee, it started with zero AAV, and now almost every study uses AAV vectors. These, of course, are small icosahedral single-stranded DNA-containing viruses, which we talked about also in this course. We talked about how the genome, a single-stranded DNA molecule, is replicated, and these unusual terminal repeats at each end. These viruses encode very few proteins. They have a rep region that encodes the rep proteins needed for DNA replication, including an endonuclease, and a capsid region that encodes capsid proteins that form the icosahedral capsid. Now, these are rather small genomes. Look, there are 4.6 kilobases. So there's not a lot of room, even if you take out most of the DNA coding sequence, which is, in fact, what most people do. Yet, that's often enough for most genes. By the way, we like adeno-associated virus because when you infect a the cell, they seem to stay in the cell as long as you can look. They have long-term expression. If you infect mice, for example, the, the viruses remain seemingly indefinitely. They exist as episomal DNAs, and the expression is for long periods of time. So this can be very advantageous. And there are also multiple serotypes as well. So here in panel A is a diagram of the viral genome, two in inverted terminal repeats that form those T structures, the rep genes and the capsid genes. And what you do is you cut them all out, and you make a gutless vector shown in B with just ITRs, a packaging sequence, and a promoter. And you take that DNA and you transfect it into cells. At the same time, you transfect into cells a plasmid encoding the rep and the cap genes. So this plasmid will make the proteins needed for replication of the viral genome and for packaging of it. In addition, because these are adenovirus-associated viruses, they need adenovirus as a helper to make particles. But you don't want to put adenovirus in your preparation. So you put in plasmids encoding the adenovirus proteins that are needed. So again, over the years, people spent a lot of time figuring out exactly what adenovirus proteins are needed to help adeno-associated virus, and those are the E1, E2, E4, and VA coding regions. So you take plasmids with those, so you have three plasmids, your vector with your transgene, a rep cap plasmid, and the helper functions. You put those into cells, and out comes recombinant AAV. This virus is very disabled. The only thing it can do is bind a cell, get in, and make mRNAs. It cannot replicate. It has no rep and cap regions. It's got just the transgene, so it will never make infectious virus particles once it's introduced into a host. But this is a perfect substrate for gene therapy. And I'll show you an example of how that's been used as well. These vectors are highly modifiable in terms of their serology. There are many different serotypes already. So here on the left, these bars are capsid genes from different AAV serotypes. Let's say we're different colors. And you can take those genes and modify them in many ways. Here I'm showing you, you could mutagenize. You could take the pink one and introduce amino acid changes in an attempt to change the serotype. You could shuffle bits of different capsid genes to make recombinant capsid genes. You could insert peptides into different regions, all sorts of things as long as you have an assay for changing the serotype. 
And what you would do is you would take your recombinant DNAs with all these modifications, you would transfect them into cells and culture, and then you get out a crop of new viruses with modified capsids. Of course, many of the changes you make are going to knock out the ability of the capsid to form. You never see those, but that's fine. You take the viruses that come out, and then you can subject them to different selections. For example, you could take a column full of beads to which you attach antibodies to the known serotypes of AAV. And so anything that has not had its serotype changed is going to stick to the column. And new serotypes will flow through. So you can take what flows through the column and amplify them. And then you could go with this whole procedure over and over again until you completely change the serotype. And then you can, of course, test these in animals. So people do this to derive new serotypes. This virus is very flexible in its ability to accommodate changes that allow it to replicate and package, yet change the serotype. Again, the idea is if we need to go into people several times, or if there's already existing immunity to these viruses, we can make a serotype that doesn't exist out there in nature. Quite nice. So adenovirus, adeno-associated virus. Now let's move into RNA viruses, retroviruses. And these the prototypical retrovirus, which by now you will recognize. You'll look at these gene maps for the rest of your lives and immediately understand what's going on, or at least I hope so. Here on the left, we have retroviruses with simple genomes. Avian leukosis virus, Rouse sarcoma virus. They encode gag, Paul, and envelope. That's the map of the provirus right there, which is inserted into the genome. Some of these are used for vector purposes. And of course, the advantage here is that the DNA will integrate into a host cell and be a permanent member. On the right is the genome of HIV. We call this a retrovirus with a complex genome because in addition to gag, pollen, envelope, as I said last time, uh, these viruses encode a lot of other small proteins that have a variety of functions. I have put here four asterisks to remind myself to tell you. Last time we talked about the emergence of HIV, its ability to infect millions and millions of people and our efforts to get around it. So here is a huge pandemic virus that has emerged, and yet we've turned it around and we're using it as a vector. Can you imagine the virus that's infected 75 million people and caused 35 million deaths? We can now turn around and make a vector out of it to make people healthy. I just think that's remarkable. And most people don't think about this, but we have virus vectors, lentivirus vectors that are based on HIV. So we have vectors based on lentiviruses or other retroviruses. HIV is unique because it can infect non-dividing cells. The other retroviruses, RAUS and ALV, they need the cells to undergo mitosis in order to get their DNA into the nucleus. Remember, during mitosis, the nuclear membrane breaks down. And it's at that point that the DNA produced by re reverse transcription in the cytoplasm is able to get into the nucleus. HIV does not have that limitation. It can infect a quiescent cell and get its DNA into the nucleus without the, the membrane having to break down. So for vector terms, that is a good property. As I said, there's long-term expression because the provirus is an integrated copy. These genomes can take about 8KB, which is pretty good. Some negatives, unfortunately. Because these DNAs integrate into your genome, there is a possibility for insertional mutagenesis. They could disrupt the gene that's essential, or they could turn on a gene like an oncogene. And I'll show you later an example of how that has actually happened. We can get around that by making either the three prime LTR inactivated. Remember, there's the same LTR at each end, and it's the, the three prime LTR that is a problem because that one can activate a downstream gene. Or we can make integration deficient viruses, but that of course gets around the major advantage that they're long-term activation. Now in order to get retroviruses, so here we have HIV in a a retrovirus with a simple genome below it. In order to get these to infect as many different kinds of cells as possible, we often replace the viral glycoprotein 
with that of another virus. And a common one that we use is VSV glycoprotein. VSVG has a very broad host range, can affect many different cells. So we call that pseudotyping. We include the VSVG glycoprotein gene in these vectors, so now they have the ability to infect a lot of cells. Here's how you make retrovirus vectors. And this, again, begins with basic research, where people found that if you have two plasmids, one encoding the capsid or the gag protein region, and the other plasmid encoding the envelope protein. If you take these two plasmids, transfect them into cultured cells, out will come virus particles. So the structural proteins, gag, pole, and envelope, are enough to drive the production of virus particles. Of course, there's no viral genome in there because we haven't included it in this construction. So the next step was to figure out that you could put a foreign gene into these particles. So to do that, you take your capsid and envelope plasmids again, and you add a third plasmid containing a transgene. And this plasmid, of course, needs to have a promoter in order to drive expression of your transgene. But most importantly, this plasmid needs to have a packaging sequence in it so that your transgene is incorporated, is packaged into the retrovirus particle. And that's something that came from the study of packaging. People wanted to know how packaging worked. They discovered packaging sequences. And now we can put almost any transgene into a retrovirus as long as it's within the packaging size of the particle. All right, so that's retroviruses. Now moving on to a few other types of vectors. Here is how we can use pox viruses, another scourge of humanity where we can reverse the virus and make it work for us. And in this case, this is a virus called modified vaccinia virus on CARA. And that vaccinia virus, of course, is the smallpox vaccine that we use, and we did use to eradicate the virus in which we use in certain conditions now. This virus can grow in avian cells, but not in mammalian cells. What was done was to passage this virus extensively in chicken cells, and it lost its ability to replicate in mammalian cells. There's a block at assembly. So these, this virus, MVA, will get into mammalian cells, will express genes, but it will not assemble new virus particles. Some of the advantages of this, pox virus genome is huge, so it's got a big capacity. You can never run out of space in this genome. You can work with it under BSL-1 conditions, the, the very lowest biocontainment, so it's very safe to work with. Uh, and the other day when I talked about HIV vaccines, I also told you about the use of a canary pox virus for vaccine purposes. It's another variation of uh, using a pox virus. This is a virus that infects canaries, but not us. And it will express genes in us. Now, this is a very long genome, anywhere between 130 and 375,000 base pairs of double-stranded DNA. So you cannot simply put this in a plasmid and cut it with EcoR1 and hope to find a place to put your gene. It's just too big to be able to do that. Smaller viral genomes, you can do that. You can find unique restriction sites, but can't do it here. So, but instead, we use the amazing ability of these viruses to recombine to add genes. And here's how it works. You make a shuttle vector. This is simply a plasmid containing your gene of interest that you want to insert into the MVA genome. And you flank it with sequences homologous to a certain area of the pox virus genome. And you, you find out where you want to put your gene, and people have figured out where genes can go. You take your transgene, you flank it with some homology, and this is transfected into cells that are also infected with MVA. And that transgene DNA will recombine at very high frequency into the viral genome. And it's just a matter of looking at the viruses that come out and identifying the recombinants that you want simply by screening them. And there are some clever ways that you can use to select for recombinants, but recombination frequency in pox virus infected cells is so high that this is really an easy thing to do. So you can put lots of different genes in pox viruses this way. 
So here's a little summary of some of these vectors that we've talked about. Retroviruses, AAV, and adenovirus, third generation. Here are some of the advantages. You know, they, they differ in their capacity in terms of foreign DNA that you can put in with adenoviruses being quite good, pox viruses even better. Being able to grow these viruses to high titers uh, is very important, and, and many of these viruses can do that, but you can see the retroviruses don't grow very well, so you have to have different approaches when you use those. Many of these viruses are immunogenic and have low capacity, of course. Whatever your application is, you have to take into account the vector and if it suits the application. We're going to now talk about some different uh, applications of various vectors. And I wanted to first show you these two pie charts, which on the left is a pie chart showing you the types of diseases that are being addressed using viral vectors. This is a couple of years old now, but if anything, it's, it's gone up in the numbers. But it gives you an idea, for example, that cancer-related diseases are getting the majority of attention in terms of viral gene therapy, 64%, followed by what we call monogenic diseases, that is, inborn errors or mutations in one gene that we can correct readily by gene therapy, infectious diseases, making vaccines, heart disease, neurological disease, eye diseases, inflammatory diseases, etc. On the right is a pie chart showing you what kinds of vectors are being used. And here the top ones are adenoviruses and retroviruses. By the way, the N are the number of trials, gene therapy clinical trials in people that are being done using these different approaches. Naked plasma DNA is actually used quite often. Vaccinia virus, adeno-associated virus, and we have some lentiviruses, different pox viruses here, herpes, etc. So a whole range of diseases and vectors can be employed. And when we talk about gene therapy, no matter what the purpose is, there are really two broad approaches that we can use. And they're summarized on this slide. First, we can simply inject the virus into you. We can make our recombinant virus carrying, say, a therapeutic gene or an antigen, a viral antigen, if this were a vaccine. We can simply in inject it into the patient. Hopefully, we get targeting if we need it. So if it's a vaccine, we often don't need targeting. We can just inject it, and an antibody response will occur. If it needs to be targeted to a particular organ, we can modify the vector so it is targeted in these ways. We'll talk a little bit about how we can modify vectors so that you could say, if you want to treat a tumor, instead of having to inject the virus right into the tumor, which is done, you could also inject it intravenously and it would target the tumor as well. And of course, if you need to go to the liver, that's, that takes up all the blood very quickly after anything is injected. So things go there first, and that's pretty easy to do. So one approach is direct delivery, where you inject the virus into the patient. But many applications of gene therapy don't work that way. You have to take cells out from the patient, put the vector in, and then return them. And that's shown on the right. We call that cell-based delivery. So for example, you would take stem cells. You could take bone marrow cells, which contain the precursors of many different cell types. You can culture them. And then you can infect them with your vector, typically a retrovirus, which is going to integrate into the genome of these cells. You then grow them in culture. You verify, of course, that the gene that you want to deliver is being produced. And then these can be reintroduced back into the patient. They will then establish themselves in a variety of organs and produce the cells that are normally made from them as precursors. And they, will, they should make the gene product as well. So this is done for a lot of therapy as well. We can use stem cells, and this gets around the need to find a donor for transplantation because you can use your own cells to do this. We now also are starting with embryonic stem cells uh, in the same way, so we don't need to take donor cells. We can take a variety of embryonic stem cells. You can modify them or do nuclear transplants, essentially cloning of cells differentiate them in vitro into different sorts of cells and do the same kind of procedure. So we'll talk about 
both of these kinds of applications uh, today. This slide I showed you last time, which is an example of using a viral vector as a vaccine. In this case, we're using adeno-associated virus and what has been inserted into the genome. So here's a great example of putting a foreign gene into an AAV vector. You have the two inverted terminal repeats in the packaging sequence, but everything else has to do with the production of an antibody against HIV. You can see the IgG heavy chain and the light chain. This expression will result in the production of an antibody, which was selected to be broadly neutralizing against many different HIV subtypes. So this virus can be injected into mice and it will express antibody for the life of the mouse. That's the advantage of the AAV vector. It will do lifelong expression. These mice make high levels of antibody per mil in the blood, and these are neutralizing HIV antibodies. The mice are humanized. They have been given a human immune system, so they can now be infected with HIV, which would otherwise not infect the CD4 cells of the mouse. And you can ask, are these antibodies protective? And I told you this last time, but it's worth repeating. If you look on the top panel, this is HIV copies per mil in the mouse plasma. After 21 challenges, one per week, these mice are infected once a week with HIV. The red lines are the mice that received the vector containing the neutralizing antibody. They're all protected from infection as measured by the absence of viral RNA in the plasma. And the other lines, the dark lines, are animals that received a vector containing an irrelevant insert. It happens to be a luciferase insert, which provides no protection against HIV. On the bottom, we have percent uninfected, 100% are uninfected of the mice that are given the vector with the neutralizing antibody after 21 weekly challenges. And you can see the uh, luciferase immunized animals do not get protected. So this idea that you can give an antibody as prophylaxis is being tested. It's now in a phase one trial for safety and will presumably go on for efficacy as well. Great example of the use of a viral vector. A couple of other vaccine examples. Here is an Ebola vaccine that was initially tested. This is in non-human primates. That's why the numbers here are very small because these are very expensive. And here we have used two different vectors to express the glycoprotein of Ebola virus. We have used an adenovirus vector and an MVA pox virus vector. And what we have done here is to give either single or double shot vaccines here. And the vector here is a chimpanzee adenovirus type three because no human would have antibodies to chimp adenovirus type three. You give 10 to the 11th PFU, and you only get 50% protection against a uh, intramuscular challenge with Ebola virus. So this is actual Ebola virus. Uh, if you give less PFU, you, even, you get even less protection. So that is not good. So then they switch to a prime boost regimen where you give a priming shot in, of the chimp ad three followed by a boost, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 10, 33%. If you switch to a different serotype the second time, you're worried that the antibodies induced against the first serotype might be interfering and you don't do much better. But look, if you use a different virus now, you are delivering the glycoprotein of Ebola virus first by an adenovirus, then by MVA, you get 100% protection. Now, of course, this is only four animals, and so it could be very different in people, but this is one of the vaccines that could be tested if there were Ebola. At the moment, we have no Ebola, so we can't test it. The other vaccine that was actually tested in people during the last outbreak in terms of efficacy is a VSV-based vaccine. There's VSV at the top. It can be used to infect people. It's, it's attenuated virus for humans. And the genome is a negative strand RNA encoding all the viral proteins, including the glycoprotein G. And we have an infectious DNA copy of this viral genome. We simply take out the gene encoding the viral glycoprotein and substitute for it the glycoprotein from Ebola virus. Here's the Ebola virus particle has a negative stranded genome where the gene arrangement is very similar. You take the gene encoding, 
the Ebola glycoprotein, you put it in the VSV genome, and now you have VSV EBOV. And this was tested in animals and looked good. It was tested in a phase one in humans, which is just for safety, small numbers of people making sure there are no adverse effects. And then during the outbreak in 2015 in Western Africa of Ebola, this was actually put into use and it was tested and it looked pretty good, but then the outbreak stopped before we could really get good numbers. Before it went into humans though, you always have to have animal models demonstrating protection, and this is a non-human primate challenge. Again, very few animals, but we're looking at percent survival here. We have animals uh, immunized with either a control vector or the VSV EBOV, and then they are challenged intranasally 28 days after immunization with 1,000 PFU of Ebola virus, the control animals all die by 10 days. So the animals that receive just the vector, they all die. The ones that receive the vaccine are protected. So again, in non-human primates, this ve vectored antigen looks very good, and that's why it moved into people. This vaccine is not licensed because there are not enough data from the West African outbreak to license the vaccine. And so if there's another outbreak of Ebola, probably somewhere in Africa, and there will be, this vaccine could be used in an, on an experimental basis and it might help people to survive and we'd also get data uh, on its efficacy. The problem here, of course, is that if you have a vaccine that you think is gonna help people, it is not really ethical to have a control group, right? If you have an outbreak where thousands of people are getting Ebola infection, you can't take half of them and give them the vector and half of them and give them the actual vaccine. That is absolutely not ethical. But the only way you can test your vaccine is to have a control. So what was done last time was to give one group the vaccine and then three weeks later, the other group receive the vaccine. And what they would do is identify a case of Ebola and then vaccinate everyone who had contact with them in the immediate family, healthcare workers and so forth. And that was delayed three weeks in the control group. So everyone got vaccine. It was just a matter of delaying the control group. And from that, they got data suggesting that it was efficacious. So you have to do unusual things when you have ethical considerations like that. Here's one other vaccine I want to tell you about which uses a different kind of vector. It's really interesting. This is another HIV candidate. This is using SIV as a model because you can then infect non-human primates with SIV. You can't infect non-human primates with HIV. So we take SIV and we take viral proteins and put them in a rhesus cytomegalovirus vector. So we talked about human cytomegaloviruses, herpes viruses, these are large DNA containing viruses. Macaques have their own cytomegaloviruses, rhesus cytomegalovirus. So uh, that has been modified to be used as a vaccine for macaques. SIV proteins were put into this. And this is an experiment of two groups of macaques. They took half of the animals and gave them the vector alone, and the other half were given the vaccine. I think there were seven animals in each group. And, and then they were challenged with SIV. So this is all SIV because that's what you can use in these animals. And here we're looking at plasma viral load with weeks post-infection. So we're looking about a year after infection here. So vaccination then challenge. You can see these blue lines are the animals that receive the vector. So they are all replicating virus. And down here are the animals that receive the actual vaccine. You can see them all individual animals on the right there. And you can see most of them, there was an initial burst of replication after challenge, and then most of them controlled infection. There were a few blips here and there in different animals. You can see by the color, and this one in red, later on started to replicate. But overall, it looked good. And these studies, which were done uh, out in Oregon, are continuing. And if they work, the idea would be that you would then take a human cytomegalovirus vector and put HIV proteins in it and try the same kinds of experiments. 
All right, so that's vaccines. Let's talk about gene therapy. For this, we look to take care of monogenic diseases. These are caused by a mutation in one gene, so we can put in one gene. It makes it simpler to do that. Uh, there are over 6,000 different monogenic diseases. That they, they occur in one out of 200 live births, so they're quite frequent. And this is where we can use gene therapy. There are about 1,800 clinical trials ongoing at the moment that use vectors to try and take care of these uh, monogenic diseases. Here are some of the diseases caused by one gene that are under investigation using viral gene therapy approaches. We'll talk about a few of these. They, they, they include severe combined immunodeficiency. You can see the incidence in the population here on the right and the vector that we're using to try and take care of these issues. Uh, lipoprotein lipase deficiency, hemophilia, hemoglobinopathies and thalassemias, alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, and then a series of diseases that lead to blindness, retinal degenerative diseases, and one of them is called Leber's congenital amaurosis, which we'll talk about using AAV vectors, X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy, and wiscott altridge syndrome. So you can see the different viruses, retroviruses, and adeno-associated viruses are the main ones being used for these because here you want persistent gene expression. For the life of the individual, you want that, and you get that with a retrovirus or AAV. So let's take a little historical look at gene therapy. This is one of the earliest trials in 93. The first one was actually in 1990 for adenosine deaminase deficiency. But here is the first one for cystic fibrosis, 1993. This was done in a 23-year-old male who was homozygous for a mutation in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene. And of course, individuals with a defect in this gene cannot maintain uh, the proper environment in the lungs. They get a lot of infections as a consequence. And so we're looking to give these individuals a wild type copy of the gene to correct this problem. And so this individual who is shown here was given by intubation, so they put a tube into his uh, trachea, and they sprayed in two times 10 to the eighth PFU of an adenovirus, an E1, E3 deleted, so generation one adenovirus, containing the wild type CFTR DNA. And so it was sprayed on his airway epithelium. Here is a, is a section they could, while they're going in there with the intubation, they can take samples and look for viral gene expression. So pre-therapy, these are what the cells look like. Post-therapy, they've stained this with an antibody against the product, the CFTR product. You can see cells are producing it very nicely. And on the right is a graph showing the expression of the exogenous protein as a ratio with what was in there, the mutant protein, the altered protein. This uh, individual received three applications of the recombinant adenovirus. And you can see after the first one, there was a burst of uh, protein production. And that went down in days. This is time in days. And then he was giving a second and had another burst of protein production. And then at the third, there was no response because by that time he'd had a pretty robust antibody response and the virus wasn't able to express the third time around. It was cleared. And so this being a very early trial told us that antibody responses were really going to be a problem. And because of that, we have developed uh, modifications of serology for these viruses, as I told you earlier. But this was a pioneering study because it had never been done before. You know, people had to make these viruses, make sure they worked in culture, and, and make sure they were safe for administration. So this, and in 1990, gene therapy, as I mentioned, got people very excited about using gene therapy. A number of trials then started to move forward. Uh, unfortunately, there was a real setback which is uh, unfortunately the death of Jesse Gelsinger. This was a trial done at the University of Pennsylvania, and it was to correct ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. So he was an 18-year-old who volunteered for this study. He was actually not seriously ill. He was 
it's heterozygous for mutation, but he volunteered because they called for volunteers and he, he decided to help he and his father. And what they did was they gave him an adenovirus vector with the wild type OTC gene and they wanted to see if it would be expressed. Unfortunately, he died four days after receiving uh, this vector. He was a healthy kid, nothing else wrong with him. But what happened was they probably gave him too much virus. He had a massive uh, over exuberant immune response and he ended up having multiple organ failure. And this was, a, was obviously heavily investigated and it turned out that UPenn had broken a lot of rules. They hadn't followed all the protocols properly. And if you search Jesse Gelsinger, you can find lots of uh, things written by his dad, for example, about this. There was a lot of controversy. It really put a damper on gene therapy for some time. Another notable uh, gene therapy landmark was a trial to try and repair X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency. So this is a case where you have a problem in your T cells, your B cells, and your NK cells. So you may have heard of this as bubble disease. There was a child years ago who lived in a plastic bubble because he was susceptible to infections. I think he made it to 12 years old and they gave him a bone marrow transplant from I think his sister to try and complement his deficiency. Unfortunately, his sister had Epstein-Barr virus. And as soon as they put that in him, of course, it went crazy replicating because he had no immune defenses and he died. Uh, this disorder arises by a, a variety of mutations in the IL-2 receptor common gamma chain. And that's shown diagrammatically here. And all these circles and triangles are mutations identified in patients that lead to dysfunctional gamma chain and which lead to severe combined immunodeficiency. So there were two trials set up with infants in London and Paris giving them a retrovirus containing the normal gene. And what they did is they took bone marrow from these infants, which contains, of course, the precursors to all the, the lymphocytes. They put it in culture. They infected it with the retrovirus vector, confirmed that the protein was being produced, and then they infused them back into the patients. And this actually worked. It cured their immunodeficiency. Unfortunately, in Paris, four out of nine infants and one in London developed leukemia between three and six years after this treatment. So their immunodeficiency was cured, but apparently the vector had integrated next to an oncogene in these individuals and turned it on, and they got leukemia as a consequence. So they were treated and turned out all right, but this raised the specter of insertional activation of oncogenes, which you have heard about when we talked about how retroviruses do that. At this time, everyone started freaking out. There were lots of trials going on with retrovirus vectors. They were all halted for a number of years while people figured out how to inactivate that right-hand uh, LTR. And so now we don't have this issue any longer. But you see, we learn from doing these experiments. We try and make them as safe as possible, but sometimes things go wrong. Another interesting monogenic disease that seems to have been able to be treated is X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy. This is caused by a defect in a transporter called ABCD1, which is important for the, trans the proper transport of fatty acids. And what happens is because of the defect, these build up and it leads to damage to the myelin sheath of nerves. And the, the, the scan on the upper right, all the white areas, is showing you demyelination in these patients. So what they did is they, again, took out bone marrow from, I think, two patients in this trial. They infected them with a lentivirus vector containing the normal transporter. They reinfused this into patients. And again, those bone marrow cells are going to become resident in different areas and give rise to lots of cells that are producing the proper protein. Both of these individuals had resolution of their demyelination. These, this disease is accompanied by neurologic instability and they become stable 
and got better. And on the left is the brain of one of these individuals. You can see the demyelination is restricted to a very small area of the brain. So this not injected into the brain at all. This is injected. It's infused intravenously, these cells, yet the cells that are made from those stem cells can get into the brain and pro provide the proper uh, transporter function. One that's been in the news recently has been an approach to treat blindness. And these are blindnesses caused by inherited retinopathies. These are usually untreatable, they are monogenic, and they are caused by mutations in photoreceptors and the pigment of the retina. So if you look down at this diagram, here is your retinal pigment epithelium in green. So that would be on the inside of the retina of the eye. And all of these cells contain a variety of genes which can be mutated and lead to blindness. So these include the epithelium, the cones and the rods, and variety of nerve cells that uh, are connected to them. The way this works is that they identify the gene that's mutated, and then they provide you with a wild-type copy of the gene. This is usually done in an adeno-associated virus vector, which is injected into the retinal epithelium directly. So they put the needle right through your eyeball and into the epithelium. The virus replicates there, spreads throughout the epithelium. And because this is adeno-associated virus, it's a long-term persistent expression. Now on the right here, each of these lines is a different gene that's been identified in this retina that is associated with blindness. And these are three different approaches to correcting this using three different vectors. This is adeno-associated virus, lentiviruses, and adenoviruses. So each line is a different gene therapy trial that is ongoing to try and correct mutations. And you can see, for example, this top three boxes, these are genes in the, uh, the retinal pigmented epithelium, and below them are genes in rods and cones and so forth. These are first tested, of course, in animal models. Uh, of all these vectors, AAV has been the most promising. And one of them I want to tell you about is, is called Lieber congenital amaurosis. This is blindness caused by mutation in a gene of the retinal pigment epithelium, RPE65. Its protein is needed for photoreceptor function. So the wild type gene from dogs was put into an adeno-associated vector, and dogs given a single subretinal injection restored their visual function. So you can put dogs through various tests to see that they're seeing, and this worked. Uh, one of the leaders in this field is Catherine High, a physician. She used to be at UPenn, and she now moved to a company to commercialize these products. But I talked with her on TWIV 350, really a really interesting person. Anyway, this vector went into humans, and it was very successful, licensed at the end of last year. You can see FDA approves novel gene therapy to treat patients with a rare form of uh, inherited vision loss. It's called Lux Turna. And I remember seeing uh, in December a uh, documentary where they took one of the kids who had gotten this, I think he was 12 years old, and he said he saw his mother for the first time. So that is going to be more in the, in the gene therapy arena because this works very well. And again, it seems to be long term. I mean, we're only a few years down the line with the dogs and the humans, but it seems to be persistent. So we've had a number of gene therapy successes, some of which are, are shown here. Uh, the, eye, the blindness is the only one that's been licensed of all of these so far. The others are in clinical trials. We can also kill tumors with viruses. Some viruses normally grow in tumors without any modification. Sometimes we have to modify them, and I'll tell you about how we do that. Uh, we made a little video about this with Linda Coughlin last year about how this works. To target viruses to tumors, we can modify the proteins that are needed to attach for measles virus, the HA protein, uh, herpes simplex virus, the glycoprotein has been modified to target it to tumors, same as uh, adenoviruses. And all of these cases, we can recognize something on the tumor cell and modify the virus to attach to it. So that's tumor targeting on the surface. We can also target post-entry. We can, for example, uh, use a virus with a promoter that will not work in a healthy cell, but will only work in a tumor cell, and it produces something that is toxic. So these can be readily identified by screening. There are plenty of promoters that are not active in healthy cells. 
So that we call that positive targeting. Or we can do what we call negative targeting. We can insert into the viral genome the target of a cellular microRNA, and that microRNA is expressed only in a healthy cell, so it gets rid of the vector. So the microRNA shown here targets the sequence in the viral genome in a normal cell, so the virus isn't activated. But in a tumor cell, there's no microRNA, and the, the viruses replicate. So again, another way to get tumor-specific replication. It's very easy to identify microRNAs. You simply look through a series of tissues, and you can see here, we're looking at brain, spleen, kidney, muscle, spinal cord. Some microRNAs are in all of them, but others are very specific. So you can simply go through, and since there are thousands of microRNAs, you're bound to find one that will be applicable to your problem. We can also arm the vectors so that they produce toxic products, specifically in the tumor. And this is because you can never infect all of the cells in a tumor with a virus. But if they produce something, if the infected cells produce something that kill the surrounding cells, that can increase efficacy. Some of the things we put in are prodrug convertases. Remember, acyclovir is converted to a phosphorylated form by the TK enzyme of herpes simplex. TK is a prodrug convertase. It takes a prodrug and makes an active drug out of it. You can also put in ion transport proteins and immunostimulatory factors. I'll give you some examples of these. Myxoma virus is being widely investigated for its anti-tumor properties. It's the virus that was introduced into Australia to get rid of the rabbits. It doesn't replicate in us, but it infects many different kinds of human cancer cells. We're not quite sure why. One of the reasons is that they don't make an antiviral response, and they have activated pathways that allow virus replication. So here is a table showing you some of the efficacy of myxoma virus in a, a number of different models. So here are the cancers that are being looked at here. And typically, these are injected into mice so that they form tumors. And for example, you can give myxoma virus. You can take these cells, human AML cells, you infect them with myxoma virus, and then you inject them into your mouse model, and you can see 90% 90, 90 of the mice are free of, of cancer when you treat these cells this way. So those are ex vivo treatments that are very effective. Here are multiple myeloma. Or you can inject the virus directly into the mice. You can establish the tumor in the mouse, human tumors in mice, and infect them and see the, the effect on tumor burden. So the idea here would be, say someone had a a tumor that required extensive chemotherapy. You could take out bone marrow and preserve it before lethally irradiating the person. But the bone marrow is going to have some tumor cells in it. You could infect it with myxoma virus to get rid of them before putting them back into the host. A, a Bacorna virus has turned out to be quite interesting for treating some tumors. This is Seneca Valley virus, a contaminant of serum. It turns out to come from either cows or pigs. It does infect people, but it infects cancers, certain types of cancers. And this has gone through phase one and two. Phase two didn't show great efficacy because it looks like this virus is inhibited by interferon. So actually, we have started to work on this in the lab to see if we can disable the interferon response when we deliver this virus. Measles virus is another one that's been used. It turns out the vaccine strain preferentially replicates in tumors because it can't antagonize innate responses. And what they have done is they put a gene for a symporter into the viral genome so that when they give this to patients with tumors, they can also give them gamma-emitting isotopes, and they will be taken up into the tumor cells because the symporter is expressed. And you can visualize the tumor nicely. And if you give them beta-emitting isotopes, these, again, are concentrated to the tumor cells, and they help uh, eliminate them. Not too many years ago, this was tried for treating two patients with multiple myeloma. And multiple myeloma is a B cell tumor. You typically have clonal B cells. If you look at the top here, these are flow cytometry plots of these two patients. You can see pre-treatment, they have normal and clonal plasma cytoid cells. And after treatment, no more clonal cells. Same with patient number two. And one of these patients had a mass on her right 
frontal lobe, you can see it here, and then in the close-up, you can see it right there. So they were both given 10 to the 11th particles of measles virus intravenously, and the imaging here is in part because of the symporter included, and you can see that her mass disappeared. So multiple myeloma is characterized by masses, not just clonal plasmacytoid cells, but masses throughout the body, and one of these individuals had a complete remission. A herpes virus has recently been approved to treat melanoma. This is called, I can't pronounce it, telimogene la herparivec, or TVEC. <laughs> what they've done is that into this virus, they've put a gene for GMCSF to recruit other immune cells to the tumor. They've deleted two viral genes that make it tumor-specific replication. Here's a neat one that you should remember. They've deleted ICP-47. ICP-47 is a viral gene that blocks antigen presentation. And we don't want that. We want CTLs to kill the tumor. So that's been deleted. And the phase three, this went through phase one, two, and three for melanoma, injecting the virus into the melanoma. They had a 16% response with the vector as compared to 2% with just injecting GMCSF. So this was approved in 2015 by the FDA. It's called Imligic, Imligic, and here's a press release for that, and it's actually pretty well written. The TVEC is injected into the tumors in a version of herpes simplex that has been genetically modified so it only replicates in cancer cells. It also includes a gene that encodes a cytokine or protein called GMCSF, which recruits immune-boosting cells to the tumor. The hope is that the combination will not only speed up the drug's cancer killing effect, but stimulate the immune system. So this is a feature that we're putting into these vectors more and more, immune modulators that attract the immune response. So this is pretty well written, except a modified herpes bug. I don't know why they did that, but they could have just said virus. So please, if you ever write this stuff, it's Forbes. If you have, please don't forget your virology. Don't say bug. Oh, here are two adenoviruses that are very cool. One is CG0070. It's armed with GMCSF, but it preferentially replicates in RB deficient tumors. It turns out that most tumors have defects in RB. Remember the cell cycle checkpoint protein. And this virus has been designed so it only replicates in cells lacking RV, RB, which would be a tumor. And this is in phase three for bladder cancer. It's injected into the lumen of the bladder. That's what that means. So here's how it's designed. You remember, adenovirus transcriptional program. You make E1A first. E1A knocks off RB from E2F, frees up E2F because the viral promoters need E2F. So what they did in this virus is they put the E1A protein under the control of the E2F promoter. They added an E2F promoter here. Normally E1A would be transcribed immediately upon entry into the cell. But now this vector, if it gets in a normal cell, it's not gonna be transcribed because the normal cell has RB. And with RB present, E2F is not freed up to drive E1A synthesis. But if this gets into a tumor cell that lacks RB or has mutations in it, E1A will be made, E1A then drives the GMCSF gene, which they put downstream in the viral genome, driven by an E3 promoter, which is driven by E1A. And this virus will make GMCSF in tumors. And this is looking quite good in certain kinds of tumors. Another one has been licensed in China for treatment of head and neck tumors. It's called Oncorine. What they did here is they deleted the E1B55K gene. This is needed to degrade P53, remember, when these viruses get in cells, they inactivate RB, but then they have to deal with P53, otherwise it would cause apoptosis. So this virus doesn't have E1B55K, so they can't degrade P53. So they will not replicate in a normal cell. A lot of tumors have no P53. And so this virus will replicate in them. It's brilliant to use what we've understood and learned about transformation to make vectors that are tumor Specific, very cool. A couple more before we wrap it up. Vaccinia virus, uh, JX594. This is a company called Generex. Edward Jenner, right? 
It's cool. So armed with GMCSF, they deleted the TK gene. So the virus is normally doesn't replicate, but tumors have high amounts of TK, so they makes it preferentially replicate in tumors. And here the idea was to put it intravenously and see if it could reach tumors and specifically replicate in them. And so they took 23 patients with tumors of, of various sorts that weren't responding to anything else. You can see all the different tissues. And they gave these people intravenous, Generex, 594, and asked, does it replicate in the tumor? And what they found was that the virus, which is marked with a green dye, you can see, is replicating in tumors in half of the patients. You can see rectal tumor, uh, endometrial tumor, colon tumor. And there was also anti-tumor activity in half the patients. In other words, this is pretty neat that you could put IV vector. These people have multiple tumors, so you can't really inject virus into all of them. So having a proof of concept that this works is really uh, important. We can put drug convertases into these vectors. For example, thymidine kinase would convert gancyclovir to gancyclovir triphosphate, which would then be a chain terminator for the tumor cells, and it would stop them from replicating, or cytosine deaminase, converting 5-fluoro-C to 5-fluoro-U. So basically, the prodrug will not kill an uninfected cell because there's no convertase in it, but in the tumor cell, where you've gotten your virus specifically in that, it will convert the prodrug into a metabolite, which will then kill the tumor cell and the neighboring tumor cells as well. So that's what we mean by arming these drugs. And here is one called TOCA511. It's a retrovirus made by TOCAGen. And it's a murine retrovirus into which they've put the gene for cytosine deaminase. And this is for treating certain brain tumors. They inject the virus right into the tumor. So these are gliomas that you have nothing else to do. You inject the virus into the tumor. The virus makes cytosine deaminase. You then give the patients 5-fluorocytosine by pills. It reaches the brain. It's converted to 5-FU. And the 5-FU then chain terminates within the tumor cell and kills it. Poliovirus has also been part of this uh, interesting revolution. What they did was they took the Sabin vaccine strain of poliovirus and took the internal ribosome entry site and substituted it with the sequence from rhinovirus. And this just turned out to be attenuating the neurovirulence of this virus, and it could be injected directly into gliomas in the brains of patients. These gliomas have uh, upregulated poliovirus receptors, so they preferentially take up the virus, and the virus kills those cells, but it's not neurovirulent for the remainder of the brain. And this has been on 60 Minutes, there was a very interesting story last year of a couple of patients that had received this. I find this really amazing. Here we have a virus that paralyzes you and we're actually sticking it in your brain to, to cure a tumor, yet we've modified it so it doesn't cause paralysis. And the last one is a rheovirus. So here's a double-stranded RNA virus that we talked about a long time ago. This is a virus that is a mouse virus. It's not pathogenic for humans, but it turns out to replicate in a wide variety of human tumors. And so that's just something that was discovered fortuitously many years ago. And it is in phase three for a whole slew of different tumors, including head and neck tumors. Uh, the company that has pushed this forward is called Oncolytics Biotech. And I, I show you a, a capture from their website because, I mean, science is everywhere now. Look at this innately adaptive. We are using rheovirus to uh, destroy tumors. And they find that as the tumor cells are being lysed by the virus, this causes inflammation. It makes sense, right? All the viral particles that are being released are sensed. And they're trying to figure out how to use that to further uh, destroy the tumors. And that's why they call it immuno-oncology. So you're going to see in the future, not only using these viruses to cure tumors. If you go to medical school and become doctors, in your career, you will be using viruses to cure most tumors, I think. And it will be probably a combination of the approaches I've shown you together with uh, immunomodulators. And that makes me bring up the last point, which is 
CAR T-cell therapy, which has just been licensed by the FDA last year for treating certain kinds of leukemias. And here the idea is we take a tumor cell, we identify a tumor antigen, and then we produce a chimeric antigen receptor that will recognize this antigen and we have it expressed on a T cell. The way this works is you make single chain antibodies against your tumor antigen, single chain antibodies, and you make a chimeric molecule, including a transmembrane domain, and then co-stimulatory and signaling domains to activate the T cell. You deliver this to the T cells with a lentivirus vector. You take T cells from the patient, you infect them in a culture dish, they express the chimeric antigen receptor, then you put them back in, and these go after the tumor cells. It's really remarkable what can be done now. All of this is because of basic research. These are wonderful translational approaches, but none of it would work if people weren't working in the laboratory just being curious about the viruses that they're working on. So we always have to be a balance between basic research and using it to cure problems in the clinic. So that brings us to the end of this course. This is day one, which some of you may remember, way back in January. I want to thank you for taking it. There's a couple more things. There's a survey at CourseWorks that I'd like you to take. If you like the course, please say it. That makes the people in charge here allow us to continue it. If, if you don't like something, you can be nicely constructive. We would appreciate that. Finish the quizzes by Sunday midnight. I have office hours this week. And most of all, I don't want you to forget what you have learned here. You know, I really like viruses. <laughs> all right, I love them. I have them on my license plate because I want people to see them. And I see people taking pictures of my license plate every day, so I know I've got them to think about viruses. I do a lot of um, social media, as you know. Here are places you can follow me. If you do one of these things, follow me and keep in touch and you know, learn about viruses from time to time. It has been my honor to teach you. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you remember one thing, please always be curious. Thank you very much. <laughs>